Sri Lanka to be followed by Czechia. To remind you that you and I both are victims of a jealous mistress and that's the law. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, you have asked a very pertinent question as to whether there are unique features related to the use of information and information technolo communications technology that requires a distinction to be made in terms of how international law applies compared to other domains. The answer simply is in the affirmative and permit me to offer a few points for the consideration of this distinguished assembly. Let me deal with territorial boundaries, the most obvious one. The first and most troublesome distinguished feature, perhaps ICT allows for a seamless transfer of data across national borders, making it challenging to determine jurisdiction and apply traditional territorial principles of international law. How do we resolve it? Secondly, the use of ICT introduces new legal challenges in addressing cybersecurity threats and combating cybercrime. International law needs, to, I say, to adapt to address these emerging issues effectively. Thirdly, with the proliferation of ICT, the collection, storage, and transfer of personal data has become more complex. International law, such as the General Data Protection Regulation, as we know, has enacted to, was enacted to safeguard privacy rights and regulate data processing, a matter that needs careful consideration. Then the troublesome aspect of state responsibility. With the proliferation of ICT, ICT enables state-sponsored cyber activities, such as cyber spionage or cyber attacks. Determining state responsibility, therefore, for such actions and establishing appropriate legal consequences, I say is a unique challenge in the application of international law. The next I can think of is internet governance. The decentralized nature of the internet requires international cooperation and coordination in addressing issues of internet governance, including domain name management, internet protocols, and content regulation. So these are a few examples of how unique the features are and of why ICCT necessitates a distinct approach to international law compared to other domains. The other aspects are obviously are things like the digital divide, cross-border data flows, intellectual property rights. Now, in the case of intellectual property rights, we know that ICT has made it easier to copy, easier to distribute, easier to modify digital content, posing challenges to traditional intellectual property regimes. International law, such as the World Intellectual Property Organization treaties, addresses issues related to copyright, patent, trademarks in the, in the digital area. Now, these treaties must be encouraged. Then I get to internet freedom and human rights. The use of ICT has both facilitated and challenged the exercise of human rights online. There is no question about it. Uh, we have, quite, quite frankly, we have no control over it. International law recognizes, therefore, the importance of protecting the freedom of expression, privacy, and other fundamental rights in the digital realm. Then we have state sovereignty in cyber operations, jurisdictions and cross-border disputes, international cooperation. So these are some aspects, Mr. Chairman, that highlight the unique feature of ICT and their implications. Now let me very quickly address the aspect of gaps in how international law applies to the use of ICT. Now these gaps are due to obviously due to the rapid advancements of technology. Let's look at the jurisdictional challenges which I alluded to before. Determining jurisdiction in cross-border cases involving ICT can be very complex. Different countries may have different laws and regulations, making it challenging to enforce international legal standards consistently. Bridging this gap, I say, requires enhancing international cooperation, harmonizing laws, and establishing mechanisms of resolving jurisdictional disputes. Then we have the aspect of the global nature of cyber threats, which requires a coordinated international response. Bridging the gap in cyber security and cyber crime enforcement involves strengthening international legal frameworks, promoting information sharing and capacity building and fostering cooperation among states, law enforcement agencies, and international organizations. 
I have dealt with the aspect of state responsibility, and I can emphasize it once more. Privacy and data protection, internet governance, capacity building, which we will deal with tomorrow, international cooperation. Now, bridging these gaps requires a multifaceted approach that involves legal, technical, and policy measures. Now, we also, at the same time, must remember that there's, a requ there's an urgent requirement for the harmonization of laws and the development and implementation of international treaties and agreements that play a crucial role in bridging gaps in international law, enhance international cooperation, and so on and so forth. So there are several approaches to bridging these gaps, which I will not allude to due to the constraints of time. I'm compelled this morning, having listened to one of the distinguished delegates, to speak a word on, on the application of IHL. Mr. Chair, international humanitarian law, also known as the law of armed conflict, primarily governs the conduct of armed conflict and the protection of individuals affected by such conflict. Now, while IHL does not directly apply to ICT law, as a separate and distinct legal framework, certain aspects of IHL can be relevant, I say, in the context of ICT. During armed conflict, ICT plays a significant role in modern warfare, including in areas such as cyber operations, information warfare, the use of autonomous weapons. In these situations, IHL principles, such as the principles of distinction, proportionality, and precaution in attack may be applicable to the use of ICT in armed conflict. It is worth, I say, noting that the legal framework governing ICT primarily falls under international law, including international human rights law, international criminal law, and international law on state responsibility. So while IHL principles may apply in specific situations involving armed conflicts and ICT, they should be interpreted and applied in conjunction with other applicable legal frameworks. So in summary, IHL, does, although it does not directly apply as a separate legal framework, certain aspects may be relevant in the context of ICT during armed conflict or in situations where cyber operations and attacks are conducted as part of armed conflicts. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Sri Lanka for your statement, and I know that you bring uh, to bear through this uh, statement of yours all your vast experience as former Attorney General of Sri Lanka and, of course, on the bench of the Supreme Court as the Chief Justice. Thank you very much for your presence and your participation.